And Crypto Talk Radio got a special request from a listener. And as we've said on the social media, we are a podcast for the people, as is all of our podcasts in the network. Of course, with Crypto Talk Radio, it's a little bit different because we find on our own projects that we try to cover that we think are worth your time. And then sometimes we'll get, you know, listeners that say, can you cover this one? Because they appreciate the coverage that we give. It's not like the cult members on the Seifu side. We're talking people that they actually listen. They listen to what we do. They understand that we take a look at it. We provide our thoughts and that everybody's free to make their own opinion decision about what to do with the information, but that the information is you can visually go look and see it is factually accurate. Not like the cults. And I've I've apologized openly to the even the Satama Wolfpack because Right now, with the price dips that they've suffered under, they're now at the fangirl stage. They're no longer cult. They're still the rest we trust, but they're the exception to the rule. They're no longer the vocal majority as they were. So I appreciate any time somebody reaches out and says, can you take a look at this one? We are happy to look at any crypto and give our thoughts on it. And the one that they asked us to take a look at is actually a project underneath the larger one. So I'm going to start with the larger one because I think it's important that you have the history of where this came from. It's been around for a while. The company behind it's called Laguna Games. They're, they're formed out of San Francisco, in the United States. So already I knew that they were a serious contender in the gaming space. And they have a number of games that they've got on docket. One of them is Crypto Unicorns. That's what I'm going to cover today because that was what was specifically requested. Anybody that understands the gaming aspect with blockchain knows that Axie Infinity, even to this day, kind of runs the roost as far as popularity worldwide and the potential for using blockchain to support gaming. There has not been, though, any gaming, I would argue, any gaming project that has done what I would like to see that would change the way that we do it. And I said it on one of the past episodes. Could you imagine if any of these projects were to take something like Stardew Valley which is arguably one of the most popular games ever made. Something like that, and then you attach blockchain technology directly to that. People have spent hundreds of hours on this thing. Or let's say you do something like Elder Scrolls games, those types of games, and you somehow tie cryptocurrency. We're talking the big games. We're talking games that they're going to consume a lot of time, and they're they're going to keep people's interest in a very perfect way. There's never been... I don't think any game that's done that perfectly, a game like a Harvest Moon, a game like a Rune Factory, those types that they have just visceral cult followings and they're large games and they're substantial games and they look like they're worth your time. Never has done. Axie Infinity's games, I don't really rate. I've never seen a game like a Minecraft come and tie to cryptocurrency in that way. There's a couple that tried, but they weren't anywhere near good. So I looked at this Crypto Unicorns, and of course, being tied to Laguna Games, I have credibility attached to it because it's a United States formed entity. It's a fully formed entity. In the United States, as a formed entity, there's a natural KYC because you would have to have exposed who you are to form the business in the United States. There's all sorts of documentation. These guys aren't going anywhere. So I can tell you straight up the jump, there's no scam here. You, You couldn't. It's nearly impossible. Even though there's a formed business, there are ways in our legal system to get at the individuals underneath it if they were to run and leave. But I also took it a step further by looking into the projects that they were doing and their main site, which is Laguna.games. These guys have a background in gaming. They understand gaming. They understand server development. They understand platforms. So platforms, of course, being Android, Apple iOS, Mac OS, Windows, they understand technology very well. They're very transparent about what they're doing. They have a, a open communication, so predominantly it's Discord, and because it's game-related, that's perfect. Anything that's game-related should be in Discord. They don't even have a hint of Telescam on their site, so already, Hercules, Hercules, because they're not, not only are they not forcing you to Telescam, they have no hint of Telescam anywhere on their site. So right there, they've got strong, strong credibility because they're not ducking anything. They're right out in front and they're putting themselves out when they don't really need to. I looked at some of their, just out of curiosity, 
some of their jobs there that they have available. They are worldwide. They've got people all over the globe. They're transparent in where people are. They tell you locations. They don't need addresses, but at least tell you where the people are coming from. People from the Philippines, people from Hungary, people from Johannesburg, uh, Canada, uh, and then mostly in the United States. And in the United States, we're talking core technical technology hubs. Portland is a tech hub in, in on the rise, mostly because of Washington. Uh, Vancouver in Canada, because you can get proximity-wise, you can get there from Washington State. Eugene, Oregon is kind of on the rise, not quite that large. And then, of course, San Francisco is like the center of technology. So they tell you where they're at, but also they give you photos of all the people. Probably my only complaint about their about page or their you know people page, you can't it takes you more steps to go and find more information about these people. So there's photos, but there's no links to get to any of the background. You could figure it out if you took the time. It's not like they're trying to hide it. I just think they should link to these people's LinkedIn profiles. So I can tell looking at it, pretty much all of them probably have a LinkedIn profile and chances are these photos came from LinkedIn. That's automatic credibility. They have experience in Unity development. Unity is one of the strongest game engines you can think of. And apparently they got people that came from companies like Blizzard. Anybody that knows Blizzard knows they put out solid games each and every time, even though they've had issues from a social media, you know, a court of public opinion perspective. But the point is solid developer, Electronic Arts, solid developer, LucasArts, solid developer. The only one that caused me a little bit of concern and it's not their fault and anybody else looking at it, Probably wouldn't have resonated, but I see Kabam. Kabam as a company, I do not, I have concerns with. Kabam, just so that people know, was a company, I think they still exist, but not in the same way. Kabam was a company, they spun up a couple of games some time ago. One of them was like Godfather uh, 4, 4 something or other. There was a Godfather game. There was a number of other games that they released. And some of these are really fun games. And what Kabam would do it was basically free to play. And so if you heard me on a past episode, I talked about creating the games around things like Valkyrie Crusade, where it's free to play and people are buying these gotcha boxes and there's a lot of money in this, but nobody's ever capitalized on that model. Kabam was right in the center of that model. They were right in the center of that model. They were, I, I'd say one of the poster children for doing that. So the fact that they've got experience from a developer that knows how to do that and made a lot of money, that's a good thing. But the fact that it's Kabam and Kabam ultimately did rip some people off with some of the games, because what would happen is they'd spin up a game. They even had a game around, I think it was Lord of the Rings. They had a number of games that were tied to big IPs, like movies and so that the Godfather, right? They had all these things. And then all of a sudden, it's like the game would just shut down. And it's, it's jumping, it's popular, huge. And then they would just shut it down after people had invested potentially thousands of dollars in the games. And so they got a really big negative rep back at that time because of what was going on. They're one of the developers around that time. So I'm, I'm giving them pros and cons. I'm saying it's good that they have the experience in free to play models and being able to monetize those models, which could support something like this. I, the con would be because it's Kabam and because of some of their practices of, well, it's not as successful as we think, we'll just shut it down. And they didn't make people right. Now, because it's cryptocurrency, I'm assuming it'll be impossible for them to do it to the same degree. But at the same time, it is a risk I would call out. How much of a risk? It's too early to tell because they have a pretty deep team. There's a lot of people here. So it's possible they're just using and leveraging the knowledge of the game development and design and not necessarily the monetization models. I still call it out because if anybody is or is was aware of Kabam's games, that's one person, you know, set of experience that's part of this. And you probably can cons- consider if you remember the games they were shutting down, some of those games are really fun. And then they took a lot of money and, and took it away. Not equivalent to a rug pull, but just you could get into some of these games and they get to a point of popularity and then they decide to shut it down and you're out a lot of money is a risk I call out. They're currently in a hiring phase and I just took a look at the careers to kind of get a sense of their development strategy. It looks like they're, I would say, predominantly development related, which is good. 
So it could be that what they've got out there was good enough for now, but they're wanting to try to ramp up some of the actual game developer and either get more games on deck or enhance the ones they have. With Crypto Unicorns, it looks like they position this on the Polygon network. The number one risk of that, if you remember what happened with that garbage Sunflower game, it literally brought the network to its knees. And that game didn't do anything. It didn't do anything. It was just poorly optimized code. Some of the stuff talked about here in Crypto Unicorns as far as the way the model works, I'll get to that in a second, but also just the the time that you're investing in it. I think it has a strong risk because it's Polygon where there could be some performance issues over time at scale as more people get on it. That, of course, would negatively impact investors because if you remember what happened with that Sunflower garbage, when it brought the network to its knees, the Polygon core token tanked in value and people lost a lot of value. It seems to have recovered pretty strong now with some of the optimizations they did. But a game like this looks like it's 50 times what that Sunflower game was. So we have to, this will really test the robustness of the Polygon network as a gaming network. To me, this doesn't feel like it's a good fit for the Polygon network, although I understand why they went there. I would have chosen a different network if I were them. I might have chosen Avalanche. And I say Avalanche because Avalanche strikes me as more stable for what I see. They might pull it off and it's perfectly stable and it's perfectly performant and everything's clean. I'm not criticizing the choice. I'm saying I think Avalanche might have been a better network to consider, even if it was up front, get the popularity there and then test something like Polygon because the Polygon already had those issues. And it looked like this was formed prior to the catastrophe of Sunflower. So it's possible that it's perfectly cool and clean. This game, the Crypto Unicorns, it, the way they built it combines multiple types of tokenomics. So there are there's a Unum token, UNIM, and then an RBW token. The way it looks like they did this is they took, like some tokens are in the gaming world, it's about land, right? You own land and you can build worlds and you have a piece of land that you own. And then there's another token that's around the unicorns and some of the screens and some of the videos talk about you can customize your unicorn and then your unicorn. They have like racing games and there's farming games and nursery to grow and nurture and all this. So it's a very it's a time consuming game. It's not designed to shake up gaming. It's time consumption. You're just going through the motions and doing what you're doing. And that's OK. Nothing problem with that. I'm calling out that. This, and I saw this on the videos too, this is something I think will appeal very strongly to the international crowd. I think the, especially the ones that, that are, the ones that are really, like in, in Japan, for example, they are very heavy on phones for gaming, less so consoles, minus the Switch, but they're very heavy on gaming on their phones. That's not the case outside the Japan nearly as much as Japan. Japan, they will live and die and breathe on their freaking phones. And so I think something like this is going to really appeal to them because it's the kind of game that, you know, you're sitting on the train or something and you can, you know, mess with your plots and you can mess with your unicorns and you can do all this stuff. And I think they're going to take this very strong over time. I don't know that it's going to take as nearly as much off in other countries, particularly the United States, I think there'll be some interest, but I think as with Pokemon Go, it's one of those where it's going to lose some of the steam because there's not much to it in terms of the, the meat, like people's attention spans are very short, especially the United States. I don't know that that's going to affect it like to the point of shutting it down, but to go back to what I said about Kabam, if it turns out that people lose that interest and it starts to turn into a niche, they might drop it and go on to another project and spin something else up. That's a risk I call out. How strong of a risk? There's no way to know. It's too early in the in the process to know that. I know they have a different game called Gods of Olympus. I'm not going to cover that here. Gods of Olympus, I would guess that Gods of Olympus is going to be one that they will invest a lot of time and energy into because it has more of a probability of sustained interest over time versus what the crypto unicorns looks like it's doing. I could have it totally backwards. I could have it totally wrong. It could be that both of them thrive or neither of them thrive or who knows. I'm saying based on what I see and what I've known, it strikes me as potentially a risk there. 
the last risk I'll call out, they did a partnership recently with Warner Brothers Games, WB Games. This makes me nervous <laughs> because of the Kabam reference. So Kabam at the time, and again, like I said, I'm pretty sure they're still around, but they don't do what they were doing before. Kabam did the strategic partnership and they that was like their core. That's what they always would do is make these partnerships with these bigger organizations for branded games. And I looked at it and Kabam did a partnership with Marvel to create a Marvel game. They created a partnership with Disney to do a Disney game. Uh, there's a partnership for Transformers. And then again, the Godfather, that was a, that was one that they did. And there was another one. I, I know there was Lord of the Rings and there was a couple of other ones. There was other ones that they did partnerships with these networks that allowed them to create branded gaming experiences over time. And then they would just basically shut them down after a period, after a period of time. And these are not, we're not talking major amazing games here. We're talking like past time. They just had the name recognition, the brand name recognition. That's all it really had. It was not like it wasn't anything beyond just you see a brand and it looks kind of cool and, but there's not really much to it. Um, Godfather five families. That was the big one. That was the one that they had for the longest time. I think they had that like eight years. That was the big one. They did a partnership for the movie theater to basically license the Godfather likenesses. And it was like a map game and you would, you know, you're in one of the five families and you would take over different. It was, it was fun for what it was, but it was passing time. Uh, Dragons of Atlantis. I think that was the longest reigning game. I, I think it's still up, but it's not owned by them. Uh, but Dragons of Atlantis was another one. Kingdoms of Camelot was another one. Uh, what was the other one? There was, a, there was quite a few of them. Ultimately, the, the point I'm trying to get to is that that was Kabam and then Lord of the Rings. That's right. That was Kabam 101 was they would create these partnerships to use the likeness from these major uh, networks or studios and then release a game around it. And the game might not really even have much to do with it. Like in the Lord of the Rings game, it was just a basic map. And then you would, you know, it didn't really have much to do with Lord of the Rings, hardly at all, except that, you know, some of the look and feel as an example, uh, the fast and furious game didn't really have much to do with it. <laughs> fast and furious didn't have much to do with it. Uh, the Hobbit, that was another one that they had. They had two games around the Hobbit. Didn't really have much to do with it. It was a generic battle game. So I suspect that's a risk here is that if over time they build out and they decide to go that way with Laguna Games, could be that this Crypto Unicorns, if it doesn't sustain the popularity, could die out over time. And so then the tokens then would lose their value necessarily because the tokens, the activities of the game are what sustain those token values while they're using it without that you don't have that much volume to sustain in summary what i'm saying is i think number one it, i can guarantee you this company's not going anywhere in its current form you're talking people that you can find them they're easy to track there's no i would say near zero risk of any sort of rug pull by definition i don't see that they would even trigger something that would cause a loss of money other than potentially losing interest in a project if it doesn't get the steam that it wants. So the biggest risk on this one, the number one risk on this one is they, they're they basing this on the assumption people are going to stay interested in this project. They're hoping that they'll, that'll be the case. For what I can tell, it should be. Question is how long? That's what I don't know. Nobody can tell. I think it's worth taking a look at if you're interested in it. I don't see that it would take over Axie Infinity or any of that. That would be a stretch. If they do, great. That would be a stretch to me only because Axie was like one of the first to get to a point of like they're already so far ahead. I think it's going to be difficult for something like this to surpass that. However, they might take the approach of spinning up, you know, volume like multiple different games and then collectively they're able to usurp Axie. I struggle to see it as a, a potential, but I recognize that they're working hard at least to put out credible projects. Now, I got to give them that. I got to, I have to attack them and be consistent. And I hate to do it, but I got to do it. Garbage book, I'm sorry. The white paper is not a PDF. And I'm extremely disappointed to see this. 
And I know people don't, are wondering why does it matter? It matters because if you don't have a PDF, you can't easily hold them accountable for these secret changes that people tend to make. We should always have a PDF of the white paper so we can save it and hold them accountable. With something like this, the risk would be changing the mechanics of how the reward system works. There's a whole elaborate reward system tied to playing the game and a treasury tied to it and all sorts of wallet key consideration, all this. And they're making changes even now. And without having a PDF white paper, there's no easy way to hold them accountable to see if they secretly change something. I'm not calling them malicious. They could make the change and then not tell people because they forgot or they overlooked it. If we have the PDF white paper, we can test and see what changed over time whenever they publish a new one. With a Git book, you can't do that. And so I'm not a fan of them using Git book. I don't like it. I think it's stupid that all these tokens are doing that unless they want to do it just to make easy edits, but then they publish a PDF. There should be a PDF, period, point blank. So I give them kudos for everything except the white paper is what I'm getting at. Everything else is solid. Everything else is clean. The white paper is the number one thing that gives me pause. And I hope they resolve that because everything else is great. Like you don't have any other issue. I just, I'm a big stickler that you should have a PDF white paper, especially now that you're making these changes. So again, that's Laguna.Games for the main site. And it's talking about crypto unicorns on the Polygon network, it looks like. And tied to some tokens that would power this, the rainbow token, uh, as well as the UNM token. So if you want to check it out, I'm not saying it's, I'm telling you that there's no risk of a malicious intent on this one. I'd say near zero risk. But there is the other risks I called out with the Kabam entry thing with the way that they had worked in the past. The lack of a PDF white paper is a concern them being on Polygon is potentially a concern. And these are kind of surface level things to consider. If you're just going in it to potentially invest and back the project, I don't see that as an issue. Just be aware you're tying your investment to the activities of other people that may or may not be there in the long term. Other than that, sure, I don't see an issue with that. If you're into games, it's something to look at, especially if you like those kinds of games, like what we see with crypto unicorns, this might totally enthrall you and then you might spread the word and get more people to play it and then help your own value as well as that of your peers.